Hi everybody, it's Jagazus. This is Untracing Trauma, another episode with another very special guest. Here we have Joe Yonko, or aka Jessica Sorrell. And basically, she's lovely. You're gonna get to know her. We're gonna go over uh just I guess religious past, religious trauma, what she did to escape it, how she's healing herself, what her life looks like now compared to back then. Whatever that may be. I don't know her entire backstory, so we'll find it out together. If you've never been here before, go ahead and like if you're on YouTube or rate if you're on Spotify. We have both audio and visual versions of the podcast. And I guess a little trigger warning up front, the show is called Untracing Trauma, so there might be something triggering in there. We'll see. Uh, So just probably not a kid's show. Just want to give you a warning. But yeah. I will now let my guest speak. Hi, Jessica. How are you? Hi. Good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. I've been off for like a couple weeks, so I'm like, what's the name of the show again? I'm trying to get back into the flow. (laughs) Oh, okay. So we met on TikTok. Yes. Yes. So everyone right now. As does everyone. That's (laughs) definitely all my guests, at least, are coming from TikTok. Um, And so I know that you do, we were just talking about this before we started recording, you kind of fell into the deconstruction ex-Christian space on TikTok, again, as so many of us do. Um, (laughs) Do you want to go ahead and speak to that, like how how you got started there? Or, um, because you did say you were doing a business first. Yeah, how did you you fall into the the Christian topic? Well, originally I had TikTok during... Oh, the pandemic because of my children and we were making like in the house board videos and I did not know how to use it and then I'm like oh I can use this to promote my businesses I'm a creative I do interior decorating I do photography so I tried to make some videos and I'd get like 20 views like a lot of people they first started TikTok and then when my now wife and I got engaged I posted a video and that kind of blew up which had like 20,000 views and I was like okay and of course If you're queer on TikTok, you get haters in the comments. And so that kind of lit a little fire in me. I know, surprising. It's weird. Um, And then I did a video on um, why I left Christianity. I was just like, you know what? I'm going to talk about it. And that blew up and got over a million views. And I was like, oh, so this is my niche now. This is like what I talk about. No one cares about my business anymore. This is what the people want. They want trauma. (laughs) Yes, yes. It's just, oh, I so, wish I had that when I was going through all my trauma. Oh, like, TikTok was not a thing. And so I 100%. Alone, so it's awesome. Now. Let's get into that. So when did you, I guess, start, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say like leave the religion, but when did you start differing yourself in the religion? When did you start deconstructing and say like. So the thought process actually started. So I was in a very um, mentally and verbally abusive marriage, which I can maybe Ooh. touch on a little bit later that. because of the church and a you know, good submissive wife. Mm. And then um, while I was like trying to avoid my husband at all costs, I was wicked involved in the church. I mean, I ran a, it wasn't, it was a social enterprise. So it was a for-profit business that functioned like a nonprofit. So I donated hundred percent of the proceeds. So I just didn't want to have a board and like go. Through oh, OK. Your business, not the church. But yes. No, my business. OK. So I started that. I like dove head first. And- I feel like the church is a for profit business. Alfred, I was like, wow, they're for- that's up front. Good for them. Yeah. The church, I might actually like, <laughs> oh, you're honest. Um, No, I started one because, again, I'm trying to avoid my home life because I was miserable. Okay. Yeah. And so I volunteered in like every program in the church. I was in charge of Bible studies when people needed meals brought to them. Like they would call me and I would set up meals for like people who are sick or women who just had babies. Oh. And so I and then I helped come up with ideas for like the sermon, like different sermon series. I was just there like six days a week. And then I started my social enterprise business. We donated 100 percent of the profits to organizations that fought against human trafficking. And then I employed refugee women. Wow. So it was a really cool business. We made like yeah. bands and accessories out of used materials. Yeah, I was speaking at churches, at colleges, at schools. Like I stayed very busy to avoid my whole life. And also I really believed like, you know, I remember being at a Women of Faith conference. Oh, those conferences were. I remember that. My mom used to go to that. Yeah. Not, also, a uh, fun fact, like 90% of the speakers are all divorced and like have deconstructed themselves. Like Glennon Doyle, Jen Hatmaker. So that's cool. 
Oh, I know. Mr. Grant, Amy Grant, who's pro LGBT. Oh, no, yes. Yes, yes, yes. I got to see all them speak. But anyway, one of them, I was just praying, like, God, break my heart for what breaks yours, you know, and that's when I kind of got the idea to start my business. And then I was still very Republican, conservative, good little straight housewife, um, evangelical Christian. It was a non denominational church that I was attending. I grew up Wesleyan. So I grew up like Wesleyan. Yes, like can't dance, which was hard for me. Ooh, okay, we'll get to that. Strict. So then, yeah, I find this non-denominational church, and I think they have like a rock band on Sundays, and I'm like, yeah, they're progressive, which is so for- cool. Their hair's down, and yeah. yeah, they claim to be progressive, but then obviously, when you're there six days a week and you see behind the scenes, you're like, and when you're a woman, yeah, yeah women are on the they can't have leadership positions. Mm-hmm. I remember I was really close with the head pastor. Um, yeah, I marched in his office one day. I was pissed because I didn't know there were no women on the board. And I'm like, why are there no women on the board? And they like laughed at me. And I'm like, no, no, for real. And they're like, well, there's a couple women he thought about, but we asked their husbands and they said no. I go, oh, do you ask the the wives if you let men on the board? And they're like, well, no. And I'm like, oh, hello. Okay. Like, well, it's, I... and it's like, we don't ever do anything that will cause conflict. And if men can't handle their wives being on the board, I was like, I argued and argued. Like, I was so angry. And so just a lot of behind the scenes things. Yeah. But I'm getting ahead of myself right now. I'm like yeah. stepping around. No, but- no, no worries. I, I I asked. Okay, let's let's actually back it up to like the very, very original. So you said you were Wesleyan. So I'm assuming that was the religion of your parents. Like let's go back to how you were raised. Um so, so were you I- born into Christianity or was it something that like you came about when you were 10? Are you a life longer? Like born into a religious family? I That's where I'm getting. Your religious family. My okay. well, my mom's side. My dad just did what my mom wanted. My dad was cast. Same. Did it, what is that about? The care. He yeah. Like went, Dad's see, like, I guess I'm Christian now. Yeah. My woman is, so I'm yep. happy. But I want to have mom. sex with that one, so <laughs> I'm saved. Yes. Hallelujah. Um, my mom's whole side of the family, all of them are missionaries and pastors and like my grandparents uh, planted a church so that's all my mom knew and so i was born and raised in i went to priest so you're a church. pastor grandkid yes basically um and i um i just remember i think i was saved by like age five but i also remember being saved over and over and over and over and over again oh yeah i was like 30 because i keep reconfirming it every time you I doubt a, yeah so i get a car accident in 20 minutes and i just thought a bad thought or something like am I gonna go to hell so I like my whole life I just I feel like I don't remember when I was saved I was just repeatedly saved is that a great I thing I wanted to cover my bases I want to talk about that for a second because I don't think we talk about that enough um like in evangelical spaces it's insane how much a they put like weight to like thought crime and how you're constantly monitoring your own thoughts or feelings to see if you're sitting but it's also really Interesting, because like, you compare that to the Catholic faith, right, where they have an actual confession and, like, an actual retribution system set up. And then that's why they have, like, you know, a priest to come in and give you your last rites. And it can be done even post-mortem, God forbid. But it's funny because that's a good system because it takes off so much stress as compared to the evangelical side. We're like, I have to be saved. What if I die in a car crash tomorrow? I just said shit. Or, like, whatever it may be. Like, you're... You're constantly afraid of losing that salvation. So I was like, I was just thinking about how funny that is compared to like Catholicism. It's inconsistent. Like different evangelicals think that once you're saved, you're always saved. Yeah. So I yeah. think that. And then there's the horror of like, the, I would just shove down your throat. The unforgivable sin is blaspheming the Lord. So I'm like, oh, what does God. it actually mean? Like if I doubt, does that count? If I'm like nervous around friends in school and I don't claim yeah. the Lord is my savior, like I'm yeah. blaspheming the Lord. So you, I mean, that's trauma right there. You're just it's insidious. Fear. Yeah, constant it's fear. Like I did it in. wrong. I'm gonna burn in hell as a six year old because I was too embarrassed to speak up around my peers. Like yeah, okay. So do you remember? So since you were saved at five, do you remember? Like, did you have any feelings around? You said like as a six year old, being afraid to talk around your peers. What What was your experience like in childhood? Were you like constantly terrified of God or were you on the very much I want to save people I don't know I don't know how to describe because I don't want to like lead you I don't want to I don't want to lead you I actually was thinking uh, about this last night it's a thought I hadn't really put to words before but I had an amazing childhood so I talk about religious trauma it almost feels like am I like how to explain to people that knew me growing up like I 
you could have an amazing childhood and still develop trauma without realizing it. So like I was super involved in youth group. And I mean, I was there like anytime I could, but I told my parents, like, I want to hang out with the youth group kids or because I mean, it was like party nonstop, like having yeah. this party night and this theme night and going on this over like camp overnight. And just having community is great. It was so fun. Yeah. And so I really had an amazing childhood and it was just, you're not realizing when you're having all this fun, like the things you're getting indoctrinated with throughout the way, like throughout the whole entire process. So it's all of a sudden you become an adult and you're like, why do I hate my body as a female? Why am I scared to do this as a female? Why am I petrified of hell? And you're like, oh, all those fun lock-ins when then the pastor would beat home like the message, you know, like I might have had fun, but I re- learned really damaging like theology. For the audience out there, a lock-in for whatever reason and purpose is when you take a whole bunch of teenagers in a room, lock them, horny teenagers, <laughs> teenagers, lock them in a church overnight <laughs> as like a get your sleeping bags on the floor. We're not leaving until everyone here is saved. I've never understood the point of the actual like, lock-in. It was... We'd invite all our friends that were Christians. And so yeah, there's that. It's not like... The sleepover. They're going to have so much fun. They're going to instantly love Jesus. Like, I, I was one of those people, like, I s- helped start a morning, um, like, Bible study on Wednesdays before high school started. And then we'd uh, pray around the flagpole uh, every no. Wednesday morning. Not just the one time a year. Uh, every Wednesday. And it was when Columbine happened. Uh, and it was the she said yes. I was, yep. I think, a junior or senior that happened. So they, then we're like, oh, if a guy comes in here with a gun, like, I'm going to stand up for Jesus. Like, that's why we prayed around the flagpole every day. We thought, like... We're declaring the school for the Lord. I mean, I'm almost envious of you. I can't be in your position at the same time. That would be so terrifying to be like a junior when Columbine happens. Like, because you're there, you're in it, you're in the thick of it almost. But at the same time, like, I was probably in fourth or fifth grade. So, like, I'm almost jealous because you only had like a year left of that fear. And I had my entire high school. And then now kids today, like, from kindergarten, yeah. it's so much more prevalent. We had bomb threat drills. Those are our drills. Bomb we had earthquake drills. A lot of earthquakes. We never had lockdown drills for school shooters. But yeah, now it's like my kids, they do them all the time. It's like terrifying, which is awful. I can't even imagine. But yeah, I only had to live like a year or two. And it was still, when that happened, we thought it was going to happen anytime we saw someone with a big coat on. Or Oh, yeah. You know. Oh, yeah. They banned coats in the, every school I went to after that. Like any trench coats, anything longer than your yeah. waist was banned. Um, so Wesleyan, you weren't allowed to dance. I, I'm not familiar did, with like, what Wesleyan is, Wesleyan but is, go into that. I should know this. I, I went to a Wesleyan college also. So like, oh, wow. I should know like the doctor behind it, but it was just, it's pretty similar to Baptist. I would say, okay. um, it's like a brand. Is it based on a person? Wesley? Like John Wesley? Wesley? John Wesley. John okay. Wesley. Oh my God. I should is he like an 1800s kind of guy or is he like modern day, like a felt well, guy? One of the people that broke away. Okay. It's so like Calvin's day. Yeah. It's just a very basic, similar to Methodist and Baptist. Um, probably slightly more progressive than Baptist. Like we did. More progressive, dance. but couldn't dance. Well, yeah. But that was like the only thing I, like I tried to teach, I taught Zumba at one point. I tried to ask if I could go teach Zumba classes. And they were like, no, like it's too close to dancing. And then oh, our no. college, we had formals at our college and we weren't allowed to dance. We got dressed up and like <laughs> sit around a table and like, this is so no. fun. Like, we can't do anything. Of course, we all did like a school dances and I took dance growing up. So it was on yeah. family, was like a diehard. But like the church as a whole, yeah, brought, like it wasn't allowed. So why then do you, uh, or would you consider it more on the progressive side? Well, we were allowed to start doing, well, I don't know. I haven't really, maybe some Baptists were very similar, but I felt like some of my friends that were Baptists were more strict, like only hymns, had to dress a certain way. It was a okay. small town church. We could wear jeans if we wanted. Okay. Um, we started doing worship songs that were just hymns by the time I was in like middle school. Okay, that makes I guess sense. In no, my mind, raised... that's a little more progressive than... I was Baptist. raised Southern Baptist, so it was very much no... Well, I mean, I could wear jeans because, you know, penis. Um, <laughs> but I was raised Southern Baptist, so it was very much, you know, Sunday best and uh, very much only hymns. So I get that. That makes sense, I guess. Um, interesting. So your parents 
brought you into this religion. You've been saved. You're going through high school and all of this jazz. Um, you said you went to a uh, Wesleyan college. Let's and you also got married at some point. So I'm trying to make the timeline of your life, the timeline of Jessica. What? Do you know the question I was going to ask? No, I was going to finish my timeline, but go ahead. Sorry. No, don't finish the timeline. Were you already gay in these high school and college experiences? Or did you not even have that realization yet? Because I'm I'm curious to find out if you're struggling in childhood with that or if that was something that came later. Signs in my childhood I did not recognize because my dad would call me Ellen all the time. Because when I grew up, Ellen was the only queer on t sure. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I remember a lot of parents like, you can't watch the show anymore. But that I mean, it was so much in us and them being a Christian, like the gays. And there were a couple of kids in high school who I feel like pretended for attention, but I didn't really know anyone that Mm -hmm. actually was. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't on my radar. Like it wasn't a thought I ever had because it was, you're going to hell. It's wrong. Don't even think about it. And so I would just like was boy crazy for attention and whatnot. But in college, which funny enough, I went to a strict Christian college and I was friends with all pastors, kids, missionary kids. And that's when I first started um, experimenting with women because I guess there was not, there were not a lot of, whole lot of like people at the college. So I, I made excuses. I'm like, I'm not gay. And there's just slim pickings. So, <laughs> not, 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 not. I literally convinced myself it, I was just out of boredom. Yeah. That was it. That's yeah. all. I'm like, totally. I'm straight. I'm so straight. Guys do the same thing at sleepovers, I hear. Straight guys are like, you know, well, there's no women at the sleepover. What else are we going to do? Why? It's not yeah. like, yeah. I never got invited to those. But I wasn't, oh, you did it? No. They don't invite the gay ones to those. It's always the straight guys who have all the this... <laughs> Gay guys would be terrified. We would be out of the room. We would be like, someone's going to find out. Like, you know what I mean? Um. So, yeah. Okay. Experimenting with women at the school you can't dance at. But there uh, was so much guilt. So, like, my oh, I friends, bet. we were the party. We somehow found the party crowd. So, you know, I did the whole, like, good little Christian girl through high school. Like, waited till I was, I was, like, 18 and a half when I finally had sex. and thought I was going to burn forever. Mm-hmm. Um, but then once I had sex one time, I was like, this is what's up. And, and so then you start, you go to college, and you're drinking, and you have all these Christian friends. And you are drinking. Oh, well, we stuck it. I was on probation, Ooh. like, two semesters because they told on me. This like, college is popping. <laughs> I think all Christian colleges have that. I don't think it's like, but we drink on the weekends, make bad choices, show up to chap mandatory chapel on Mondays, super hungover, and then we feel so guilty listening to the pastor speaking. We're like, oh, so then we like pray about it. We'd all have our Bible study that week and be like, we're not having sex with anyone this weekend. Never doing this like, again. Not. Yep. We would get on each other and be like, you need to hold me accountable. I'm not drinking this weekend. I'm not having sex this weekend. And then we would just would. It was awful. Like, but it was the wow. guilt, though. Like, I almost yeah. wish, like, I had fun, but I wish I could have experienced that normal young adult experience without the guilt and shame. It mm-hmm. was awful. Awful. Mm-hmm. I mean, you would beat yourself up and feel, like, so worthless and so... And it's normal. Teenagers and young adults, yeah. like, it's normal to experience these things. Right. But I was so convinced that God, like, hated me. That because of that, and then you kind of get in this like guilt shame spiral. Where you're like, well, fuck it. I-, I was gonna say, and then it causes more. The shame yeah. literally will drive you, especially like for drinking. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. the same story with any kind of like alcoholic story that you've ever seen. The shame will push you to drink more, which causes more shame, which pushes you to drink more. Um, like it's not. <laughs> yeah, removing that would have allowed you to healthily explore more so than like feeling like you're jumping off a cliff into things. Um, that's, in, that's another great point about trauma is like literally how the guilt can cause you to on the flip side, be more, uh, depraved if you will. But so as you're going through all of this, you're still committed though. You're still in it to win it. You're on probation. Maybe you might be having sex with girls and drinking, but you're still at this point very much like into the Christian. I never very questioned, life, never like questioned my christianity my faith in jesus it was just okay. very much like balancing that like i want to experience not so sheltered and so like not able to experience anything growing up i didn't mm-hmm. that typical like go to college and go absolutely crazy yeah. i love jesus like i prayed like eight times a day but i also felt like i had this relationship 
with him where he understood. Like, he was probably disappointed, but he didn't hate me. God, I felt, it's weird because I really, like, disassociated the two. Like, God hated me. I was convinced. But Jesus was like, I was raised with this, like, compassionate, understanding, forgiving Jesus. So, I, like, I felt like he still loves me. Mm. And even though I fucked up, I'm going to do better. And then I was better and I'd, like, try again next time. So that, like, led me into... After college, I had a year, I got a job right out of college, and I lived with a friend, um, and again, was a little wild, partied, and then I just hit, like, this moment where I'm like, this is not what I want, I need to, like, find God again, I need to go back to being, like, a good person, so that's when I found the non-denominational church that I was talking about earlier, and found my husband, and it was one of those, um, we knew each other for a month, or two, started dating, were engaged. So we met in September, started dating at the end of October, were engaged in December, married by May. So, yeah, then my life just went down. Like, <laughs> ah, yeah. It's interesting that your timeline was like four months and then a wedding because usually you hear that with people who are uh, virgins, you know, and they're like, going straight into the relationship because they waited till marriage and they will do that whole little four or five month thing because they just want to get to the bed. So I, I, I find that interesting that you've already had these experiences, but you're trying to rush into the wedding more so to lock down your life, to to well, scale back the craziness almost. Also, though, we did the, we were both Christians and had like a falling away prodigal son stage, you know, found Jesus again, living our life for God. We're dating, and obviously we're still young and horny. We have sex a few times. Feel super, super fucking guilty about it. Yeah. I'll just swear, by the way. I've been swearing. Yeah, totally. Okay, <laughs> just like... Good. Um, so we feel really guilty about it, and then we stop. We stop having sex. Okay. So that alone, and I have talked about this on my TikTok, actually, because I know other Christians that do this. And, um, oh my God, Mike, I don't have to turn this off. Mike. Kid's account is attached to here. <laughs> her friend's texting her. Just pop oh. up if you heard that. I'm like, no, I, know. Oh, I don't know how to turn it off. Um, anyway, so you stop having sex because you you feel so much guilt. You're like, I want this marriage to work. And you're convinced yeah. the only way for a Christian marriage to work is if you're pure. So- Slow it down. Recommit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But then, so then it might be kind of why we rushed. Like, we'd already experienced it. And we're like, now we can't. So let's hurry up so we can. But by the time we got married and could have sex again, I had like fucked up my brain so badly because I had pushed him away and pushed him away and like Uh forced myself to stop. It was very hard to get back into it and like enjoy sex. And at that point, little red flags had started popping up about how controlling he was. But I was like, no. So then it just started this vicious cycle. Like he got angry with me instantly that I wasn't having sex with him, which pushed me away. And why I have sex with him? And it just like just snowballed into all yeah. other issues. Yeah. I mean, okay, we're just so... the beginning and we had no no one to say, hey, don't rush into this. Why are you getting married so soon? Because that was normal in the the non-denominational evangelical world. Everyone freaking rushes into marriage. Yeah. Everyone. And we yeah. prayed about it. We were like, God told us to get married. Bullshit. God does not tell people to freaking get married. I don't buy it. I think it's I'm been sorry. a little bit different now that we're like into i guess this new era from what i hear from the kids these days they're more like Like in the christian world you mean in the evangelical christian world they've slowed it down unless you're like into the whole quiverful movement thing and like trying to pop out as many kids as possible it's supposedly slowed down now as compared to like the early 2000s where it was very much every all my friends married at like 18 19 um now it's more like 25 like now it's like a (laughs) gone it's gone a little backwards but so let's let's get into this marriage i know this is part of the like part that sucks um so you said that he was controlling and demanding sex which like gross i don't know what's with straight men and doing that um i would say how how are you operating or like were you feeling like you're forced to stay with him because this is your husband and the godly thing to do is to work through it no matter what, not get divorced. Like, where were the pressure points in that? And how much of his actions do you think were coming from the church or his past trauma? How were you able to separate these things? 
So, first of all, I do not think you would have stayed married if I was if it wasn't for the Christianity because I mean, we were literally it's one of those things. Don't have sassy for a marriage. Don't be gay and don't uh, get divorced. You know, yeah. like, or don't drink. There's like the the three or four main sins like that are beat into us as at a young age. And so, divorce was not on the table. Like, didn't even consider it. So, hmm. but we could not stand each other. We went to start going to marriage counseling the first year we were married, and um, to Christian marriage counselors who were not certified. So, the number one thing I try to tell people is, for the love of God, do not go to uncertified counselors in your church for Jones. anything for relationships Jones. for mental health issues for addictions this it's very toxic and dangerous the advice is my christian therapist was also my ex-gay therapist and yeah I, I i called them on that shit i was 13 but i was like do you even have a license to practice therapy and they're like no in california you're not allowed to have a license and be able to have a religious position at the same time yeah so we chose to not get licensed so we could have a Christian business. And I was like, so you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> no, they face it off of like their one experience and their yeah. interpretation of the Bible. So like these, it was a married couple and they used their experience and assumed it would fit for everybody else. And that's basically all they had to go off of. But it was, you know, there's a triangle and you've gotten the middle oh. husband and wife. But then it wasn't even just a triangle. It was the umbrella. actually the umbrella. And like, mm. we were supposed to put it on our fridge. So it had to hang on our fridge. So I had a reminder that I was under my husband. Like, yeah, I had to do that every day for years. Um, but I, Holy moly. But I hung it up on the fridge because I was like, I'm going to work on this. I was told that I'm not even making this up. Um, you need to force yourself to have sex with your husband and, quote, fake it till you make it. Like, just get over it. And Is your wife Lee duty? It's the one thing you have to do, yeah. I and I, and I also like I remember I was supposed to go to a friend's bachelorette party, and that was one of the he's like just could not stand if I went and did anything without him, if I would drank at all or anything. So they literally said, "Well, if it makes your husband upset, you shouldn't go to your friend's bachelorette party." I'm like, "She's been my best friend since like middle school. I don't want to miss yeah. him in her wedding. No, you can't go." So I didn't go. And it wasn't that I didn't argue about it. It was just like it got to the point where I started like it wasn't worth the arguing. Anymore. Yeah, just so giving like, up I on the fight. I considered myself a submissive person. I even knew me mm-hmm. growing up. I was very like loud, outspoken, mm-hmm. extroverted, wild. But like when you're beat down enough with the comments and the arguing, like you just start giving in. So it yeah. was little things at first. It was just like you can't hang out with this person. You can't just mind you. He's going to college during the week away from home. So I'm raising our baby. Oh, you have a baby at this point. Hi. Uh, at some point, like a year after. I'm trying to remember the timeline. But like the whole like first couple of years. Like, yes, I'm yeah. raising the baby alone. He's doing whatever he wants at college. Of course. I'm supporting him in college. He's doing what he wants. I have to check in with him no matter what I'm doing. I'm not allowed to like have certain friends. And then it was like. Then it was like my job was the cooking, the cleaning, the raising the kids, like the womanly duties. Yeah. And it just and I'm also self-employed, doing everything alone. And it just like it, that right there is a trigger for me even now. Like I feel guilty. Like the dishes are done and my wife is like, oh, the dishes are done. She's just saying it out loud is like, she'll probably go do it. But I'm like, yeah, oh my God, I'm sorry. I had to do this as this day. She's like, whoa, like I don't care. And I'm like, it's just like habits because I'm so used to getting yelled at for yeah. things not being done. Yeah. way he expected but he sat on his ass and played at his phone. i think that's really good that you recognize that though you recognize that that trigger exists and that's i yeah, think I've really helpful to completely. know that it's not like yeah that's that's good my wife about it she's that's very great. like understanding and she picks up on it instantly she'll look very heavy she's like don't take out your marriage on me it's just like you're getting triggered right now i didn't mean that and i'm like you're right Bring it down. Yeah. Like, okay. Because I know so many people who let that underlying relationship trauma exist and they don't consciously recognize that's where it's coming from. And then they will start to resent their partner being like, why are they always on my ass? You know, when it's just two different languages, you're hearing something because you've experienced yeah. something and she's just like casually saying stuff that comes to her mind. And like, there's this disconnect and it can turn into an actual rift in the relationship. So. <laughs> I give you points for recognizing the trigger. Thank you. Uh, She's been great. He was also like the other big thing that really is still I probably have the most trauma from that I've had to like unlearn is what I was al- allowed and not allowed to wear. That was a huge shock to me because even though I dealt with purity culture, I was very yeah. naive 
and I never wanted to dress it appropriately. So like I didn't like, I like I believed in purity culture. I was like, I don't want to make people stumble. But I also had parents who were like, wear a bikini. Like you have like the body of a young boy. Like I didn't grow so I was in college. So they didn't care. They're like, yeah, wear the bikini. So like I did it like I was a beanpole. Like <laughs> so for the record. There's a lot of women out there with A cups who also are sexually, you know, targeted by men. So I don't know if your parents knew that, but <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Doesn't like, stop, guys. <laughs> but I'm grateful that they did it. Like maybe if I was a little more voluptuous and like had something to show off, my parents would have been a little more like, "You can't wear that out of the house." But they literally were like, "Wear it, wear it, it's fine." Weird. <laughs> it's weird how your parents are like sexualizing you, though. They're like, "No, oh, you're not that hot. You're fine." Well, they didn't say that to me, but no, they, I know. it was just obvious that like they literally did not care what I wore. They were like, yeah. yeah, it's fine. But it also was like because my dad wasn't raised religious, so he didn't put that weird, that like gross dad thing on me that a lot of the dads people... are the worst. The dads yeah, are the worst. Yeah, he didn't. I don't he just was like, again, he's like, your your body where you want. And my mom's yeah. pretty quiet about that stuff. So like, I'm very grateful that I at least had that growing up. So then that was, it was like, culture shock almost or shell shock whatever when i got married and all of a sudden the first time it happened i had a bikini on at a fam the family lake house it was just family there like two friends and my husband was furious i had a bikini on and i did not know this yet that this was like a thing and i'm like whoa whoa, whoa. he's like you shouldn't wear that around these people and i'm like well i have nothing else to wear this is all i packed he was so mad at me he refused to talk. He's like, if you don't take that off i'm gonna not talk to you the rest of the day and i'm like well i'm not gonna change and yeah okay bye See you later. Asked me the rest of the day, and then it was a fight, oh and then God. that just kept happening to the point where I gave in because it wasn't worth. And I got counseling. You know, if it makes him happy, it's not worth it. I'm like, okay, you're right. I'll change what I wear. At first, it was just bikinis. was it just over bikinis or was it like it other things? Over too. bikinis. It started right. over bikinis, and he would go bikini shopping with me, and he would approve or disapprove. I'll cry every time we go bathing suit shopping. I hated it. We settled on. A Nike two piece with a skirt for like four year old women, which is my age almost now. But like at the time, I was like twenty five with a skirt, yeah. and then yeah. me sew in like I had to sew in a piece like on my chest. Oh. So the little cleavage was showing. Oh. So that was the other the agreement. If I bought this bathing suit, he's thrown away bathing suit tops before. Like I found out years later, he threw it away because he didn't like it. Um, then it turned into I can't wear leggings because you know leggings show everything and like. Again, I have a pancake ass. Like, I don't know if people are staring at my ass. I doubt it. But like, okay, well, wear leggings. <laughs> oh, my God. So I was just baffled. So I couldn't wear leggings. I couldn't wear high heels because high heels implied sexual Jezebels. Things. I know. Um, My dresses obviously had to be like a certain leg. I had to wear camis like up to here. So like always. And he'd walk by and pull it so up. so bizarre. It is so bizarre. I am so sorry for you. But, like, as an adult being told what to wear, like, being told what to wear as a child is annoying and, like, disrespectful, I think. You know what I mean? Like, if a kid wants to go out with two mismatched shoes, let them live their life. Um, but, like, as an adult, I can't even imagine. That's so cagey. It feels like... Uh, it was, uh, and I'm a very artistic, expressive person. So, like, I would argue with him, like, I'm not wearing this to make other men lust like i'm wearing this right this is my personality but he yeah. it was just like the biggest fight i would have sent him pictures if he was already at work for the day and i was getting ready he had to like approve my outfits wow. that go change like um, even when he was not there and he was out for school and stuff yeah when he wow. was i had to, not all the time but he'd be like what are you wearing today if he knew i was like leaving the house to go do something and i'd have to send pictures and he's like no you can't wear that and weddings are always a giant nightmare weddings are always terrible um, if I was in the wedding and didn't have a say in what the dress was, like it was always a big fight, huge fight. Um, think about that. Uh, I was breastfeeding two different times. I had I was in I was in a wedding two times like after my firstborn and my secondborn within weeks. And so I don't know if you know, but like when women are breastfeeding, like sometimes their boobs are out to here because they're fills, and then you pump or but they're down to here. So I'm in the wedding, I'm pumping, but throughout the night. My boobs are getting bigger and they're filling out the dress. And then I go pump and then there'll be like a gap in my dress. And now it's just like either way, my boobs are hanging out. And he pulled me in the other room, screamed at me, called me stupid. How dare you not know this in advance and get your dress altered correctly? Go, how? You explained to me how I can alter a dress. Yeah, I don't have like. He grows with my body. Like, 
like an Elastigirl incredible suit that can just stretch yeah. at any moment. And I don't like what magic dress are you talking about? Because I did quite so okay. I mean, but it was every time anywhere we went, just a fight. Like I even look back at old pictures sometimes. Not that I want to. They pop up on something. Everyone's like, when we, I left him finally, they're like, oh, I thought you guys were happy. And I'm like, every picture to me is a terrible memory. Like, yeah. I remember fighting at this picture. I remember this picture of the fight we got in before this. I remember the fight we got in here. Like, we were not, it was not a happy marriage. And I Holly. felt very objectified the entire freaking time. I was oh, I bet. an object. Oh, that's yeah. exactly what that is. It's forcing you to have sex when you don't want to. You are the workhorse. You are providing for the kids. You, But then you can't even, God forbid, go see your friends or have any time of your own. It has to always be his approval and not even choosing your clothes like that is of course you're objectified like you were not a person at that point you were made to be like a live in i don't want to say enslaved because that's you're not enslaved either because that's a whole other bracket of trauma but you definitely definitely were in that list you were talking about in that umbrella you were definitely at the bottom and he yeah. he took that as his past um what was your breaking point when did you say or how what happened where you're like no like when did when did you break it off with him? Well, so this kind of ties back into what I started talking about when I got like off topic hundred times. So when I was running this like nonprofit social enterprise business and finally seeing how the rest of the world like I got outside of the bubble. Yeah, you know, I'm working with refugees, I'm working with human trafficking victims. And I'm just like, wow, first of all, being Republican does not align with my personal beliefs and morals at all. So I'm like, why am I voting this way? Because I actually care about people. And then I saw the selfishness in the church, the prosperity gospel, like acted out people going and praying for their new houses and their new cars and jobs. So like that was what really started my deconstruction, which I needed. Like I could not leave until I started deconstructing because I was okay. still in it. So like I had to go through a little bit of deconstruction. It wasn't a lot yet. It was very much like, I'm sorry to disagree with the evangelical church. I'm starting to, my blinders are coming off and I'm yeah. seeing the selfishness, the grief, the the power, corruption, even in, in my own church and then in the like the church as a whole in America. Just realizing your personal morals aren't actually what is being reflected in the body. Just being like, no, I don't like greed. I don't like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that part. That's my favorite part of instruction. <laughs> no, that. Where you're like, wait, the Bible says to not do that and we should be helping the yeah. four and you're like sitting here actually helping refugee women and you're like i'm doing what the bible what are you doing <laughs> yeah, and it was it was specifically the refugee when the refugee crisis happened and there were those pictures of like the young kids washing on shore um in the mediterranean for trying to escape and get over to greece from syria i yeah. posted something on facebook and all these like assholes from my church were like that's been back when they were trying to ban refugees from coming. It was right before Trump got elected. So I think he was running on that platform, but he, yeah. I don't think he had gotten elected yet. And so he had it. Or maybe it was after he got elected. I don't remember the exact timeline, but like there were already Trump supporters like growing. You know, yeah. the, the virus was growing. And I had posted about the refugee crisis. I'm like, how can you guys turn down these people? How, how can you say you don't want people to come into our country? Mm -hmm. And these assholes are just so against it this one lady I will never forget she's like god's ways are higher than ours so i'm gonna pray for them but like i i just don't think they should be in our country it's not our job and i'm like well i see your prayers aren't working yet there's then yeah. i was saying a sword yeah. the time is now not I, yesterday and i just started like these are not my people like i know a lot of relations so i start even though i'm still running a million programs and volunteer things in the church i had stopped going to the the Sunday sermons, I would like find something to do behind the scenes to keep me busy because I was like, Fair. I still not want you to go like, home. <laughs> I'm not, well, I'm not quite ready to leave yet because yeah. this is my church family, but I'm like yeah. disgusted. I'm disgusted. And I don't know. I think that was just what it took. Like the blinders finally coming off. And then me realizing, like, I was at such a low in my marriage too at the same point. Like, I remember praying and crying, like, sobbing repeatedly. God, like, why did you make my personality like this if it's not what you want? If this is not pleasing to you, like, I'm too loud. I'm too outgoing. I'm too social. I'm I'm just not a good wife. Like, and I was convinced that I was unlovable because my husband hated me so much. And, all, and it wasn't even just him. Like, I still to this day don't blame him fully because, like, his friends in that circle treated their wives the same way, but their wives are more submissive and, like, naturally just quieter. 
And yeah. so like he'd call his friends sometimes and put them on the phone with me and they would yell at me for whatever I was doing. I wonder I if like, part of the difference is like you're saying like they're your his friends wives are more submissive. I wonder if part of the difference is literally because they were raised by mothers who are the same way where you had an opportunity to be raised by like you said your father wasn't fully in No, they were equals. My parents were very like, You're equals. exactly. So you're raised in a place where he was not abusing your mother in this way. And so for you it was very unnormal after being raised 18 years or what seeing like somebody treat somebody with respect for you all of a sudden it's like a totally different kind of marriage that you're in whereas those friends are like my mom and her mom and her mom with this all quiet but yeah they they would come cry at bible study they were just as upset in their things in their marriages but then they were just like well I don't he's my husband like, I have a friend who would never, she claimed her, it was the like associate pastor, like her and her husband would never fight. They're like, that was their, their big thing. They'd counsel their couples, like, we don't fight. And then I'd find out that behind the scenes she would cry because she wasn't allowed to confront him. So she would just pray, 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 hoping God would change his heart. And I was like, oh, my uh, God. Like, so he just keeps getting away with it. Well, anyway, so it's all building up. And I remember I'm like deconstructing without even realizing it. I didn't even have a word for that yet. Yeah. Just like disgusted with the church and I want no part of it anymore. I hadn't really lost my faith. I had not lost my faith yet. I had just lost my faith in the church. And then, right. but that was what was keeping me, the people that were counseling us and yes. our friends, like that was keeping me. And then I looked at my kids one day. I had two daughters. I think there were five, there were six and four at the time. And I looked at them and I'm like, what would I say to my daughters if they were married to someone like their father? If they they had a husband treating them the way, and I was like, I would tell them to fucking leave right now. And I was like, I have to do that. And it took a little while to like finally build the courage yes. to do that but it did it for it, yourself the same way you do it for your daughters amen it came crashing down at one it was like literally like within the same week i was like i'm done and i'm done with the church and i never set foot back in that church again and i left my husband and it was hell because then all the trauma that came after that was all the people that i thought loved me unconditionally and all the people that i thought were my best friends and that loved me while i was like this golden child at church yeah uh Living. withdrew their support yep no oh, they're like i was one of my first friends i trusted like ripped me apart and she's like you're so selfish her marriage is miserable like i knew that but she was like so mean to me and there were people that were kind but by the time i've gone through like the beating i like pulled away completely i have re like reconnected with some people yeah. who have since like come out even the old head pastor who we didn't speak for years and he like hurt me he told people not to talk to me my lap the pastor did yeah but wow. he has come forward and apologized numerous times. He now says there's women on the board because of me going to his office that day and like flipping out about women on the board. He actually right. did a post about it. He's very progressive now. Very uh, like I think he's pro LGBTQ. Like he met my wife. He loves her. So like he knows wow. that to never going to church again. He finally uh, his son now is the pastor. His son's pretty awesome. They're definitely preaching a new like type of gospel. It's very inclusive. So funny enough, my ex-husband and his new wife are now speaking out against the church now that it's inclusive. So I oh well yeah with my popcorn and I that like, makes sense. Oh well, yeah, you love the church. Well, it supported you. Well, you were abusive, but right. now that they're like against that, now I'm gonna leave. Like okay. So. And I was gonna say that's probably the only way to do it. When you said that you left your husband in the church at the same time and you're never gonna step foot back there, it's like. That's probably the best way to do it because the church was obviously an enabler in the situation. Oh, yeah. Like mm -hmm. they were, especially because you were like so tied up in like the counseling and women's groups and stuff. Like they were continuously going to keep you in that situation. There's no way you could have left just him. It's a boost uh, on that level too. Like it's controlling exactly. yourself. Like they, you're sheep when you're in a church. Like they, are the, they control you. Like they do not want anyone that's in their, in their group stepping away. It makes them look bad. And yeah. If I leave, if I left him, how many other wives are now going to leave their husbands? And coincidentally enough, probably seven women I know have since left their husbands. Like, well, there you go. It's a yeah, little, it's like a it's little, a little yeah. avalanche. <laughs> he did. Um, I was watching Pray Away, and I had that same thought about like how the church is like like a sticky ball that'll keep you there because I've never been able to reconcile it myself like I kind of had the same situation as you where you're like you know disappointing God or whatever but or Jesus but like you're cool with it that's how I felt when I was like gay and after I came out and the church knew I was gay and they're all still telling me like gonna go to hell trying to convert me etc etc I'm like 
but me and Jesus are cool with it. Like Jesus yeah. doesn't care. Like I get you're mad, but like Jesus is fine. Uh, it was just because I wasn't sexually active, didn't have a boyfriend. Like there was nothing going on gay wise. It was just in here, you know. So I'm like, Jesus is like, you're a virgin. You're still dope. Uh, <laughs> um, but I was watching Prayway, and there's this guy who's just like go going through all the motions, trying to be as straight as possible and get as far away from that gay side for his church. I've never That's understood. It's heartbreaking. It's so heartbreaking. And he's an adult too, and I'm like. As an adult, why wouldn't you just go to a church that's affirming? Because they're out there. There's plenty of churches who accept gay people. If you want to be Christian so bad, why would you try to change your sexuality before you try to change your church? And it's because there's such a trap like that. They will keep you there until you change yourself, you change your life, your finances, trying to stay here instead of going to another pastor, you know? And that's so, so breaking. Like, Another part of the trauma, too, I think, is they, not so much trauma, I guess, but, like, they convince you, and this is a cult tactic, but I think every church does it, they will convince you the outside world is scary and depressing and dark. Like, oh, I yeah. was convinced, up until I left my husband, all marriages that were not Christian were horrible. Yeah. And the other, I mean, the court of The irony. <laughs> But they're, they, you're like, oh, for people that don't know Jesus are just must be depressed every day. Mm -hmm. Like, that's like the thought. So that's like, I know a lot of us use our TikTok platforms to try to be like, actually, no, like, we're real fucking happy over here. But like, yeah. churches also like petrify you. So you're too scared to like leave because you think mm -hmm. like, I have it so good, even though you really don't. You think like, this is the best it's going to be. Like, why would I step away in this scary, dark unknown? Mm hmm. That's and then there's so many layers beneath that that started, like you said, in childhood where you're like, go into hell at five. So they just keep it stacked into new relevant things such as marriage and kids. And it keeps on stacking together and they, they interplay. Um, so now you left your husband. You are at a different church? No, I never. No, you didn't go back to a church. Okay. I really quickly, because I actually had the freedom to start researching, just dove into like books, okay. podcasts, and it did not take long, a few months maybe, for me to be like, I think all this is bullshit. So I went from like still having strong faith to like, I don't know if I believe anything. And then the one last ditch effort of like trying to cling on to some piece of my faith, like crying out to God, like praying for signs like anything to show me like I was in the, I mean I was also really really depressed this I call it my dark place it was like a year and a half during the ongoing it was a very back and forth divorce because I had so much guilt and everyone telling me how selfish I was and I'm destroying my family my old marriage counselors the yeah. response from a year into it wrote a fake letter from my daughter my youngest who at the time oh, was like five letter. and said like your daughter said like mommy why are you splitting up our family so I thought that my husband had taken her to see the counselor and this was actually this happened so of course i am like broken then I, my husband was like uh i've never talked to him i've never i don't know where that came from so he like made up a fucking story about talking to my kid to try to that is disgusting back. like that is like next level manipulation disgusting bullshit and i've done i've had a lot of healing like i can see a lot of old church people but that man he still lives around here and if i see him at like aldi i will run out that and i saw him probably two months ago and i'm like nope like i am fine with a lot of other people i've done a lot of healing like that to me was like this is why licenses are important because yes. if they ever try to pull that kind of shit they'd be out of business license revoked um, I was so I was just wow. so depressed, and then I was being told yeah. by my husband, "The whole all your friends have a prayer circle to protect the kids from you." Like he was in a, a small group about performing exorcisms, like basically trying to fix me. Like the oh, uh, because you had a demon. I had demons. Yeah, the divorce demon. I forgot. Yes. Well, it was also so the coming out part is the thing that helped me finally leave my husband because i was ready for months was i fell in love with my best friend who was a female we're not oh it's not it's oh not okay no but now. so there were, yeah 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 was, but there was a, a wake up moment uh, internally yeah. where you're like why do i hate my husband so disgustingly and then i look at this woman and i'm like i like you so it was like one of those I kind of back and i'm like i still was in denial i was gay then i just knew yeah. that, like she was so good to me and filled all these voids that he wasn't like she just loved me for who i was 
which yeah. is really all I fucking needed. Like, just like the fact I'm loud. Like the That's fact what I'm everyone drinks. You know? Yes. So, I mean, that didn't work out. We're still friends because we're less certain. Sure. It's how we are. Um, But, yeah. But, so, that was also one of the demons, obviously. I now had a gay yeah. demon yeah. in me. And a divorced demon. And my parents were not supportive in the beginning. I mean, my mom literally looked at me and said, the devil has his claws in you. Um, for the gay part or for the divorce part? Or for both? All of it. I don't know. I mean, I don't think sometimes Christians understand how to handle when people break away. They have to They have to find a reason, and the reason is always the devil. Because mm. if Cause you want to go out and have the sex and the drugs. Yeah, because if we start seeing problems in the church and we realize a lot of it's bullshit, then what does that mean for their faith? So it's easy for them right. to just be like, nope, the devil. So it was a very traumatic year and a half. I lost like 18 pounds like the first like two weeks. Wow. It, and just living on my own mind you i'm living on my own in little apartment so i can working four jobs to support the girls did so, you still have the kids or were the kids like yeah, bouncing, between bouncing between houses between houses but like he kept the house i just couldn't afford the house so i'm trying to find i'm living in, like one bedroom apartments where i'm sleeping on the couch the girls have the bedroom working four jobs the church is making him meals he's a grown-ass man and the church the church group that the meals that i used to coordinate now they're bringing him meals Mind you, I'm like, I'm eating ramen noodles every night, but like, fuck you. Like, yeah, fuck. but God like, forbid. I was, dropped, I was dropped like this. Like, I did all this for you people. My husband did nothing for the church. He didn't even go half the time. But then the second he started going and I was the, I, he was the poor husband with the cheat. He can't fend for himself. I don't know how to do laundry. No one ever taught me how. He got a leadership position right away. He was leading a Bible study. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's a man who's been scorned, you know? So the whole thing. He's been through a lot. Poor guy. The original question was, but at some point along the way, I was crying out for God to like, I am so fucking depressed. Like, where are you? And like, nothing. And I'm sorry, but if there is a loving creator that functions in the way that the Christians believe that he functions, they why not show yourself? Give me a sign. Like, you know this person's like broken. And you're giving them nothing. Don't tell me it's a fucking test. Like, how hard would it be for you just to give me a little sign? Like, so I'm just at this point, I'm like, it's, it's bullshit. And to this day, I consider myself some days an atheist, some days spiritual, some days I still believe in Jesus. Like, I don't know. I don't care. I don't think it's important. I think I'm allowed to have the freedom. I don't think I'm always going to have a piece of Jesus that I love, the version that I was, like, raised with, whether I believe he was divine or not. Um, I love the teachings and... But I have no interest in organized anything. I don't yeah, you don't have to have rules or strictures around it. You're allowed to interact with, like, I mean, I I don't know. I know probably 15 atheists I can name offhand who read their Bible daily, whereas when they were Christian, it would be Bible study on Sunday. You know what I mean? Like, you're allowed to interact with this life and this history and this world and whatever you want is when you start trying to have all these really in-depth like don't step here don't don't say go don't like whenever it starts to get controlling and manipulative then you're taking the spirituality out of the entire thing um it's more about ego and it's more about man's wish and desire to have structure and hierarchy and that's not exploring what it means to be human what it means to connect to the divine that's not Churches shouldn't exist, in my opinion. Not in the way that they do. <laughs> it was wild, finally, like, being on my own. I'm not being told. Like, I was constantly called in the pastor's office. I mean, Jess, you swore on Facebook again. Oh, my God. Really? Well, like, listen, you know I have a really bad mouth. Like, I love Jesus, but I cannot help it. I say fuck all the time. That I get yelled at for that. Oh, I saw that you posted a uh, picture of drinking. I'm like, oh, my God. Here we go again. Like, I... I mean, they loved me, but I was—it was just such a controlling atmosphere because they wanted between to your husband and the church. It's like you are constant state of being thirteen. What so is when I was on my own, I didn't know how to function. I didn't know mm-hmm. how to make basic decisions. Also, on top of like now, I don't have people telling me what to do, which was awesome in one aspect. Like I have freedom, but like what yeah. the fuck do I do? I also was used to praying thirty times a day about mm-hmm. basic decisions, like mm-hmm. which. Which socks should I wear today, God? Like, we were just taught, pray about everything. Nothing is too small to pray about. And so yeah. now I'm like, I don't believe in prayer anymore. I'm not being told what to do. Like, what do 
Like, Your like decision paralysis I did, was I, everything. Yeah, it was like actually horrifying. Like, it's everything I wanted, but I was horrified. And it took me like a little while to like, and even then I still, you still have like the fear of hell. So I'm starting yeah. to like let loose and party a little bit, which is like most divorced people do. You know, you mm-hmm. have fun. Be and you don't want to be alone. Your kids aren't with you, and you're like, I am not going to sit in this house alone. So yeah. I have to go get drunk with my friends. But then I still am worried, like, oh God, am I really going to go to hell? I'd have like moments of panic, or just am I doing the wrong thing? Like it, it was hard when I finally got through that part of it and was like ex- had accepted. Like, I am much better as a person as a mother as that was happier without being married to this person like that was the huge relief and then when I realized like I survived a year and a half without believing and talking to God I'm okay and had sets like and it's so much now I look back it's been six years now and I look back and I'm like well I can't believe I believed all that like it's so like I've healed so much like I said I I can talk to people from my old church now it took me like four years five years I mean the past years probably been the most like per progression in my healing stage but i can like laugh now at stories about when i was in the church and i can like yeah. have good conversations like i want to go meet with my old pastor like we message on facebook all the time like he's funny and i sub- i defend him sometimes on his posts now because he's very black lives matter for all gbtq and the other people from the church are still like going after him and i'm like i'm gonna defend this man because i yeah i honor somebody that admits when they were wrong because we have a- i was an asshole sometimes when i was a christian i was a giant asshole so I just like, I don't know. I I feel like my feeling is just I have a lot more grace now. I mean, I was very like hated Christians the first like three four years. I think a lot of us go through that. We're just like mm. fucking angry. Yeah. And then now I have a lot more grace because I almost like I know where they're at, but I still want to have this. I still have the savior complex from being a Christian. Like I want to save people. Now I want to save. The evangelism and, like, is stuck in there. Yeah, I think it's the hardest part of deconstruction so many people it goes unnoticed that you have to like really separate that savior complex out um and just be like whenever you want to live just go do that life man even if i'm seeing you struggle and i'm seeing you in an abusive relationship like i can't be like "Mm, have you ever not wanted god to to hit you maybe that's i don't know yeah, now it's like, like yeah god jet. god starts the domestic abuse and then your husband continues it um but yeah absolutely and so what did you obviously you have a wife now so i'm sure that helped bridge or like uh change some of the relationship dynamics that you had some of the past troubling things in terms of like the controlling and like not actually having a healthy communication style with your husband so i know that probably started to undo a lot of that trauma but is there any steps that you took outside of that to start healing like did you go to therapy to process did you um do like brene brown youtube videos like what does your process look like for trying to heal so I did not go to therapy. I still, when I have the money someday, like I still would love to. I did had to do it on my own. Like I said, I was working for jobs. Like I didn't hit yeah. a spare second or and I don't think like the online therapists were really a thing then either. Like that's kind of new. So I didn't have the resources available. Um, I did a lot of the, what are the little poem books that are about like breaking up. Like I can't think of some of the author's names now. They're the quick little poem books that basically like men fucking suck. And they're, like, obviously, they're like empower like to empower females there's little poetry books and they would yeah. just like little daily like things to get me going so i was like okay like yes yeah, so, like fuck men like i can do this i read my little books i had to take baths a lot like i had my little crystal i got really into like this typical spirituality with like crystals and i'm actually at my friend's crystal shop right now like it's quiet oh yeah so, i noticed you're at a shop like, i didn't see those crystals that's yeah cool. but that's like I still needed some kind of spirituality. I knew sure. it was the Christianity, but I dabbled in witchcraft for a while. And mm-hmm. a lot, almost some witchcraft to me was still very much religion. And I was like, nope. But like my own, like some days I'll dabble in it. Some days I don't care. So I have like that part of it. Like I had some books on witchcraft, but I actually felt more peace, a lot more peace with witchcraft than I ever did with Christianity. Ever. So, like, I clung to that the first year. I was very into it the first year I left. Just the, the, it was an empowerment. Like, which yeah. was just like, 
your own thing. Like I could you've been knocked down. You have to like build yourself back up. Yeah. So I, sense. I relied on that. I found a good network of people just outside of the church. I mean, luckily, I still lived only like a half hour from my hometown at the time. So I still had people like my sister, thank God, was an atheist before I was. And she was a huge support system for me. And like she owns a salon. So all the women that worked at her salon like took me in the first year. Like I remember crying on the bathroom floor and like when people would bash me publicly on social media during this time and they would just like pick me up like literally and help me get through it. Uh, I'd be like having family, like literally having an actual family member is amazing. Like that, I can't, I can't imagine how helpful that is. And then I just eventually grew a backbone. Um, My parents are amazing now, but they were, but I also let them, like I let them talk down to me. I let them say shit to me. I was like a beaten little puppy dog the first year. But now I like tell people, I'm like, you can't hurt me. I left my husband and the church at the same time. So like, I just laugh now. Like there's nothing. So now my parents piss me off. I'm like, if you want to see your grandkids again and continue to have a relationship with them, like, you can't say shit like this. You can't act like this. Like, they did not like my wife at, at the beginning. Yeah. Like, they yeah. were not happy about me finally. They didn't accept my first girlfriend. They're like, it's a phase. So then when I started dating my current wife, they're like, they were not super nice. And I just put my foot down right away. And to me, that was healing. I was like, yeah, I have been fucking walked all over. Speaking up for yourself. Like, absolutely mm-hmm. not. So now I have super strong boundaries. But it was like the second, not all parents are like this. So like, I'm really grateful. But the second I set up boundaries, they like flipped a switch. And they were like, okay. And they've been amazing since. They Good. adore my wife. But I don't know if I would have let them keep walking over me. They probably would have. So that would be big. And just also like. So it's just like the pattern recognition, kind of like we were talking about earlier, where you recognize like, you know, the trigger of you needing to feel like you're uh, failing if you're not always pleasing or that you think that people have expectations of you that they don't. The fact that you recognize that trigger, the fact that you recognize you need to set boundaries and speak up for yourself or grow a backbone, like you said. And the fact that you have you built a community around you, including your sister and apparently just like some other people that support you. I think that's amazing ways to heal from trauma. I think that's great. And just and... having my Sundays free. Oh, my God. I just started, <laughs> I started kayaking. Like, I lived in the outdoors. You get a full like, day. I've never yes. passed this before. So I, had to tell pe- I usually tell people that, like, reach out to me. They're like, what do I do when they start deconstructing? I'm like, do something fun on Sundays. That's what starts. That's what starts at. Enjoy your Sundays. That's a great idea. I love that. Um, and, like, yeah, no. And I really, I really appreciate the fact that you talked about how dark it can be, too. Because... Uh, anyone who's gone through deconstruction, I think, knows that. But it's like it's it's hard for people who haven't even started deconstructing or are on sitting at the very beginning stages of deconstructing because they look out into the world of deconstruction and they see us being like, "Woohoo! I can be who I want. I'm gonna wear makeup today and go outside, even though I have a beard." Like they watch us like being jovial. <laughs> Plug. They watch us being jovial, and then they're like, starting out, they're like, it doesn't feel that way for me. It feels like guilt and shame, and it feels scary, and I feel like I'm, you grieve, you grieve what you're losing, whether it's the church, the community, your relationship with God. Like, there's a lot that you have to go through. There's a lot of depression that comes through that, and that's that, that's very normal, and I think we, we probably all need to, like, I don't know who we all is, but you to highlight that more as a community to let people yeah. know like i i call it out i say like yeah it's okay you're feeling this way but i feel like i haven't ever just like widely addressed it i feel like i'm usually talking one-on-one to people but we need to let people know like it's gonna be better on the other side but it's gonna be shit for some time and that's okay <laughs> yeah. i try to tell people like i would go through it all again 100 percent to get where i am now after that but it it it's not for the faint of heart like it is hard because I have friends that I think started the process of like leaving husbands and stuff, but they were just sucked back in. They couldn't do it. You know, they, yeah. they didn't know how to be alone. They yeah. had influences like the church constantly tried to influence them. Like had I went and met with everybody that tried to be with me, like maybe I would have gave in, but I was going to talk no. back in. I was like, mm-hmm. no, absolutely not. I, I've, I've heard what you had to say a hundred times. I am not right. interested until you actually come to me and say, I'm so sorry you were abused for how many years? Then I'm not going to listen to what you have to say. But not one person well, is like, I am sorry you were abused. It was like, well, well, you know. Because they didn't, 
got see it as a problem. They didn't, yeah. No, it's normal. It's how they live. So, but it, you're going through, I mean, deconstruct. I get so angry when I see these fucking arrogant assholes. These Christians are like, just rip us apart for deconstructing a thing. It's like the easiest, oh, you just wanted to sin. You just wanted to sin. And I'm like, if you knew the night that I spent on the bathroom floor just sobbing, completely broken, feeling so alone because it feels like the death of the most important person in your life. Like, my family's important, but when you are raised that God is your number one and Jesus is literally fucking inside you and you pray, you sick, you're, you talk to this person every day, a lot of times a day, and then radio silence. So mm-hmm. it's like literally a death and people don't understand that. Yeah. So, oh yeah, it's a full grieving process. And uh, <laughs> like you said, <laughs> I mean, it's not a sin. Like, I love how they, they think it's like, break up with God on Friday, go party on Saturday, come back in a year after doing your partying because you're like, okay, I'm burnt out from this binge and then get resaved next year on Sunday. Like, they think it's like a like a, a college trip or something. They're like, oh, they're just going on their Euro trip. <laughs> like, they're going to get out of their system. They're going to carnival. They're going to have all the sex, all the drugs, all the drinking. And then they're going to realize, wait, I'm still Christian. Um, not realizing that's never really. I mean, maybe it's some people's goals. Maybe that may. Sure. For some people, I guess they exist. But I don't know. Outside of Christianity, I'm sober. Um, I'm asexual. So having like had sex for the past 10 years. So like I, whatever sin they think is going on over here they'd be very bored i said at home 99 percent of the time i don't even go outside unless i have to go to the store because i don't like to <laughs> you know what i mean yep. so there's uh, a the, yeah yeah it's funny people are funny haha <laughs> I, I mean i've always been wild by nature and like to be like the life of the party so like i'll go out still but like i still went out when i was a christian like i would have just destroyed my whole fucking right. life for two years just to go to the bar like i would have just exactly. done that anyway Exactly. Yeah, and that argue it doesn't make any sense to me. I'm like, you yeah, know, Christians sin every day. Like that's not why. I'm that's reading. what I'm. That that was what I was getting at. I'm like, if you want to look at my it. actions versus Christian actions, I'm probably the pure one over here. So, I would but... love to see a study about this, and there probably is a study out there. But I'm part of an ex-Christian group on Facebook, and a lot of the guys were on there talking about when they were Christians. Like, porn is just one of the yeah. things talked about. Yeah. So, like, every guy I know from my you know, youth group until I left the church was addicted to porn. And it's like half the guys' conferences are about porn or their men's yep. groups are about porn. Yep. But these guys are like, when I left the church, I realized I'm not addicted to porn. Like, yeah. I'll look at it occasionally, but I don't have the need yeah. to anymore because it's not like being shoved down. I think it was like what we were talking about in the beginning of the episode, just like when certain things are like, you're shoved down your throat, like you're going to fixate on it more. You're like the drinking That's sad, it. like you're going to drink more when you have the guilt and shame attached to it so when yep. you look at porn then you beat yourself up about it's it. the exact same thing so it's like these people like leave the church your addictions will probably not necessarily i don't don't quote me but a lot of people your addictions might get better like you might yeah. feel in a healthier way than like yeah. the cycle in the church yeah well because there's there's a lot to be said about doing the work and actually finding you know the triggers and issues and what your actual morals are as compared to um, chalking it up to, well, God will fix it. If your remedy and solution to your addictions or your problems are, well, God will give me the strength. You're going to lose that battle, you know? Like, you will have to give me the strength. And that reminds me, you brought up morals. Like, the other thing that makes me want to, like, rip my hair out when Christians are like, well, how do you have morals without without God? How? What do you think that the second I constructed, I wanted to go murder people? Like, what is going on in your brain that you they, think? Well, <laughs> like, and they always say, well, it's because you are a raised Christian. So you already know. You already know. That's why. You already taught the morals. You got, But what if you weren't raised Christian? What would you do then? Or the other favorite one is, well, of course, because God wrote the law onto all of our hearts. So it's still God's morality, whether you know the Bible or not. You're just, that's why. And then, um, uh, who is it? Pin, Pin Gillette has my favorite response yeah. to that with the, you know, if you have no God and there's no morals from God, then why aren't you out there raping and killing people? And he's like, you're right. I have raped and I have killed every single person that I've wanted to. Cause why not? God's not going to punish me for it. 
So why not? Yeah, I raped and killed all of them, and that number is zero. Because why the fuck would you want to rape and kill somebody? What's wrong with you? Get help. Like, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, okay, so it's been fun. I feel like we're at an end. Is there anything else you would like anyone to know? So, like, I mean, again, your story is hyper-personal to you, but I'm hoping part of the shows, I, I have, you know, trans women on, I have women with kids on, I have lesbian women with kids on, I have as many different people as I want because I, I know every story is going to be super personal, but hopefully there's something that someone can take away from watching it and be like, I recognize a little piece of this, like maybe their husband is controlling or maybe they can't dance at their church. Whatever it may be, <laughs> do you have a message for that person listening right now of like, be strong, do you, live, love, laugh, N anything that you want to say? <laughs> I just think one of the most important things is like we touched on is get professional help, certified counselors. Because a lot of women are trapped in the cycle of abuse because they don't go to professional counselors. They go to church counselors that yeah. want to continue the patriarchy and con continue to, like, promote the men and, like, abuse the women. So that's just if you're in my situation at all, like, stop going to the church for help because they're just going to perpetuate it and keep you in the cycle of violence. Um, yep. That's, I mean, that's probably the biggest thing. We've seen here. what they do even when it comes to, like, childhood sex abuse they will cloister oh it and take care of the problem internally like yeah, um, they'll do anything to keep it into a closed system so yeah okay. and just like don't be scared to have friends outside the church that really helped me i know some people don't have friends outside the church because they're told not to like i always yeah. had like one foot out the door you know like straddled the fence if you will because i live close to my hometown and had not christian friends so like they came in clutch when i like had no more christian friends but like don't be scared of the outside world. Make relationships on the outside no. world. Like if your faith is strong and you want to keep it, that's not going to like hinder your right. faith. And if it does hinder right. your faith, like then maybe it needed to happen. I don't know. But I just think and trust your own, like trust your gut, I guess, your female intuition. Yeah. That's, and look at your kids. Look at your kids. Would you want the same for your kids that you're living? I think that's a huge one. That's, I've seen that play in so many people's deconstruction is having kids being their like wake up moment of like, whether it's in your relationship where you're like, I don't want my daughters married to a man like this, or whether it's like the hell thing where you're like, mm -hmm. how could you ever, ever say that you love somebody and then want to punish them for eternity, punish them in pain, even like <clears throat> there's discipline. And then there's wanting to see somebody in pain and they're very different. When you apply that to your child, that's when a lot of people are like, what's going on here? Uh, so I think children are a key part of just for sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I think that about wraps us up. So I'm going to go ahead and give you your space to say if you want anyone to follow you on the socials, you can drop them here. Um, if you have any projects or any, any business ventures you'd like them to check out, this is your time to kind of promote your stuff. Boy. Say whatever you want. Say nothing at all. It's all good. The only thing I really use is TikTok for my deconstruction content or lesbian content. Um, it's at Jovial and Co. J O V I A L and A N D C O. Um, and that link will be in the description. Okay. I, I do you have Instagram. It is Jessica Sorrell Ten. It's my private or my personal Instagram, but I'm not that exciting. Like I don't carry over a lot of my because. I'm, I'm still, I have family that follows me and I'm like, yeah. if they saw my TikTok, they would die. So I, that's like, why I got a separate one. <laughs> that's not because I have a lot of people that follow me now and I think they expect the same content. And then it's just pictures of my kids at dance competitions. I'm like, yeah. sorry, it's not as exciting as my TikTok. And then I have my interior decorating business and my photography business. But again, no one likes that on TikTok. They just want my deconstruction lesbian stuff. Yeah, but like if someone's <laughs> listening and they want to like, so are you a photographer for hire? Is that what it is? Yeah, I do like family is oh. wedding stuff like that. Okay. I mean, I, if you have a website, Instagram. you can drop it here. People, people always need to look yeah. for those, I guess. My Jovial and Co. Instagram is actually my business Instagram. Oh, okay. So cool. that was Holy originally gosh, like I was tying the two together, and now I feel like I can't change my name on TikTok because people Who's this? know it as that Jovial Co. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, okay, I can really get, believe it or not, I think someone called me, my daughter's name is Jovi, which is where I came up with the business name forever ago. 
Oh. So some people think my name is Jovial. I'm like, no, but whatever. <laughs> so it's fine. But <laughs> it's too confusing. It's a cute name though. Jovial's happy and like, yeah. light. I like it. Um, okay, awesome. Well, thank you very much for being on. I would have you on like literally anytime. Uh, I usually use this time, I guess, to do like my my exit role, but I don't think I really even have to. I, I guess I set everything up front, you know. Follow me at Jagaza. Everything's like in the, the links in the bios. Um, Patreon. I do have a Patreon now, which is where also I have a Discord. I'm not certain. I may open up the Discord in the future to everybody and then have like a closer group for, the, for just the Patreon members. But I did want to give a shout out to the Disciple group on my patron. So that would be Bart, Adele, Amy, Anna, Anna S., Arget, Candy, Carol, Claire W., Claire G., Cousin Jake, Gina, Goth Barbie, Heather, Jubilee, Kat, Katie, Mary, Modern Day Masquerade, Samantha, Shannon, and Sir Kitten. And then our newest member is Just Cuz. Um, thank you all so much for supporting. I know it's just like a couple dollars a month, but it does help me because I am on disability. But... It's not the cutest sell, but that's the truth. And yes, the time so is the good part of it. <laughs> yeah. Again, if you're you listening, you say you started as a dancing account. I did say I wanted to start as a dancing Jesus. So if you're listening to this on Apple or Spotify, uh, you might want to go to the YouTube just to check out that dance right there. That that's how we get you in. But again, if anyone's watching this on YouTube, you can go listen to this later. Uh, I know a lot of people don't like the YouTube podcast thing, and I totally understand it. But thank you all for being here. Thank you again, Jessica, for being here and sharing your story thank with you me. I'm glad you're in a better place now. I, I'm glad to see the work that you're doing out there in the world. And I just hope that everything continues to be the next step forward and that you don't go backward. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> I hope so, too. Bye, everybody.